muted. Oh, I'm so sorry. How did I do that? Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm muted. But now I'm not. So tell us where you're tuning in from. Well, I let people uh, log in and thank you, uh, Ed, for telling me that. Welcome, welcome, and we'll start in just a second here. Des Moines, oh yes, oh Des Moines, excuse me. When you're in Washington, you say the S. Portland, hello, hello. Spanaway, hello. New York City, Seattle, excellent. Welcome everyone. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder. We have just started doing some in-person cooking classes and just a few in-person author talks. Um, in the shop again, um, but for the time being, we are still here on Zoom. And the great thing about that is we get to have conversations like the one today, where uh, our interviewer is in one city, our author is in another, I'm here, and all of you are all over the world. So thank you so much for joining us today. This talk will be recorded. Uh, and will be available on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So if for some reason you have to pop off or you want to share it with other people, you'll be able to do that. We'll send you a link um, once it's live. So today we are so happy to welcome Ed Kimber, the author of the follow-up to last year's wonderfully popular One Tin Bakes, now One Tin Bakes Easy. He is going to discuss this book with uh, Shauna Seaver, who is the author of one of my favorite cookbooks of the last few years, Midwest Made, among others. The two of them are going to talk about One Tin Bakes Easy. It um, is coming out actually now on November 16th. And so um, if you have ordered a copy from us, we will send that to you signed with a book plate from Ed um, when that's available. And otherwise, if you haven't, you can support this talk by pre-ordering it from our website. And I will pop a link in the notes, or excuse me, in the chat so that you can um, order from there. <laughs> in the meantime, um, Shauna and Ed are going to talk about the book, of course, and we will leave time for questions. So please feel free to use that little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen for any questions that you might have for Ed and Shauna, and we will get to as many of those as we can. All right. So please join me in welcoming Shauna Seaver and Ed Kimber. Hello. Oh, this is so fun. This is like walking, they, she's introduced us and here we are. <laughs> it's, it's very weird because I haven't seen you in three years. No, has it been that long? I don't know. It feels like the last two years just don't really count, though. But I think no, it might all I know is that I still, you know, sometimes when you wake up at three thirty in the morning and all you can think about is your regrets in life, <laughs> and like it, for reasons you can't control. And I, oh, I think about when you came to Chicago mm -hmm. and I was so late meeting you, and it was so embarrassing. And like I never felt more just like a lazy American in my life. Like I couldn't navigate downtown. I was trying to find parking. <laughs> And I felt, I was like, oh my God, I'm late meeting Ed Kimber. <laughs> it was fine. Actually, randomly, whilst that, when that happened, I was sat in uh, that food hall place that we met in. And, Revival food um, hall. Yeah, one of the bakers locally came over and was like, hi, Ed, I brought you a whole box of our goods. <laughs> he just came up to me and gave me a box of everything. And it was the sweetest thing. So it was a happy, happy waiting period. You were spotted. <laughs> a celebrity and I was so happy when you asked me to do this because I feel like we've all been you know so separated from each other and mm -hmm. you know, like in our own little caves doing our own little work and then like yours was an email that I was like yes I will <laughs> absolutely come out of my cave for this it is one of those weird things it's like I, I don't know about you but I've become definitely more selective about what I will be willing to do now it's just like do I have to leave my house? Can I stay at home with my puppy? I'd rather do that. So I'm definitely much more selective. So oh, thank you. A really interesting, a really interesting point. And I think I've, I've talked to a lot of people about that, that that's, you know, creatives who work more like on a freelance kind of basis, okay. like we do. And selective is the word. It's like all the other stuff really fell away, you know, like the stuff that filled up our calendars. And I know for me, I mean, my last book was, fall 20, 
19, but mm-hmm. typically you would, uh, you know, that, so it came out in the fall, but then that next spring 2020, you very much do like a second round of yeah, yeah, of course. Press the next season and like all the stuff that was planned, all the travel, all the events, it just poof, like overnight yeah. went away. And the beauty of that though, and I wonder if you found the same thing um, because you had your, your book before, of course, this mm-hmm. is the book we're talking about today. And I'm so excited for my fellow Americans to get their hands on it because it's awesome super exciting. Um, the one before this, One Tin mm-hmm. Bakes. Now, when did that come out for you? That came out in June of last year. So I basically, um, what happened was the book was done, dusted before any of this COVID stuff came about. And then right. we found out we were going into lockdown in March and I knew my book was coming out in June and my heart just sunk. I thought, oh no, it's not gonna happen. But the kind of opposite thing happened in that actually people baked like nobody's business. And so the the response to the book was so amazing that my publisher basically called me and said, do you want some work during lockdown? <laughs> do you want to write a follow up? So very quickly after the first one came out, I was able to kind of fill my void of lockdown <laughs> with writing. So I was very, very lucky that I was able to kind of spend that time because all my work disappeared, basically. I do a lot of events, a lot of food styling, and just none of that stuff happened. So. I felt very lucky for that, for sure. Gift, wow. And that was gonna be my question to you, like how did the follow-up come up? Because a lot of times in the publishing industry, maybe you'll sign a book deal that says you're gonna do this one and then there will be this follow-up and that's planned, but that wasn't planned. It was a response to the- Yeah, it was definitely a response to a whole bunch of different things, really. I, they, my publisher had been trying to get me to write a book on easy baking for years, like a long, long time. And I just kind of grated against the word easy. And the only reason, and I'm sure you'll know this, is that so many books that are written as easy are quite patronizing to the reader. And they assume that you can do nothing, but also the flavors are really boring because it's like, let's do easy, just keep it simple. And I just kept thinking, I don't want to write that book. I wanted to, if I was going to write a book on easy baking, I'd still want it to be super exciting and delicious and playful and inventive. It just happens that it's really easy to make. And what happened with the last book, which was still easy, it wasn't difficult, the last book at all. Right. But we, within weeks of the first book, the, the first one, Tim Bakes book coming out, we, me and my publisher all saw this huge difference in the audience of people who were baking from it compared to my usual, my older books. And it was people who had never set foot, stepped foot in a kitchen before, never baked before. And I was getting, I was inundated with um, questions in that time because everybody was at home, you know, nothing to do. And the questions were all really, really simple and basic. Mm-hmm. And it made me think, Oh, actually, there is, I didn't realize I had more of a, uh, an audience who just liked looking at things, but had never really engaged with the content before, whether from my older books or my online um, ingredients. And so it made me start thinking about what we could do to help the people who either just want something that's incredibly easy because of time, or are a little bit nervous in the kitchen. And because that book did incredibly well, um, we knew within days it sold thousands of copies because I don't know how it works in the US, but with the, your um, sales statements, I get two statements a year that show how many books you've sold. Right. And the first one I got for Wanting Bakes months later only covered the first like three days of sales because of how the timeline works, but you mm-hmm. get it later. And it showed we'd sold something like 6,000 copies in like three days, which blew my mind and so it's like oh now I understand why my publisher was like can we do a (laughs) (laughs) follow-up so it was uh, my thinking was all about trying to capture and help the people that I saw baking during lockdown and give people that just don't even think about it it's so simple recipe and I hopefully have done that I I always have a worry because when I try to do it easy my mind slips into things that I think are easy. And I have to remember that not everyone has, you know, been baking <laughs> as long as I have. So I have to really try hard to keep everything as simple as possible and not go too crazy. And that is a challenge. That's a really interesting point that That's you just right. made because when you can do a lot of stuff, 
it's it's hard to kind of distill your process down yeah. and kind of slow your brain down, especially because you have so much like fine pastry experience mm -hmm. and you really walk that line to me. I, I always separate food people into two categories, the aspirational and the inspirational, mm -hmm. right? And for me, I've always felt, and this is kind of what was reflected in Midwest Made, definitely it's wanted to be- an amazing book, by the way. You know how much I love that book. I think it's great. It's one of, it was one of my favorite books that came out that year. I think it's so well researched, so well written, and the recipes are great. So Thank buy you. that book too. <laughs> that means a lot to me. Um, and I was so thrilled to see in the head notes, and I'd completely forgotten you'd reached out to me about the Rebel Bars, and I was like, oh my God, that's right. And Ed, by the way, anyone who wants to know the proper way to give credit for a recipe is that when you're oh. doing your book and you're very inspired by a recipe, the right thing to do is even if you're making modifications, reach out to the person who gave you that inspiration and, and give a little credit. It's never a bad idea to give yeah. credit. And uh, I think it's interesting. I think if you're reading a book and you read where the idea or even the adaption comes from, because mm -hmm. you know sometimes it's nice to see the origin of a recipe and how it's been developed. And I, I, I think the difficulty is publishers so often want to trim the fat in those intro sections and sometimes I'm not saying they actively do it but I can easily imagine that publishers are like let's get rid of that line let's get rid of this line and those things would be very easy to cut so I think it's important to kind of stand up for those things and you know show where your inspiration comes from if it's you know applicable to a recipe. There is some of that that has to do with the publisher and the editor mm -hmm. but I think as you and I have both done multiple books you know as the author that the impetus comes from us. Like the yeah, responsibility exactly. is on the author to, because yeah, yeah. If you don't give credit. Your editor is never going to be like, oh, is there someone else? You need to add it in totally. You need to do it. They might take it. away, but they'll never add in for sure. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, um, but we were talking about inspirational versus aspirational. And for me, just kind of the type of person I am and my background, I've always kind of thought of myself as more of an inspirational person that I mm -hmm. would want someone to see it and like immediately get up and go into the kitchen. And then there's mm -hmm. aspirational people that you know, throw up beautiful people or beautiful pictures of the things they make on Instagram and you're never going to make that thing, but gosh, it just makes your heart sort of jump and that's yeah, aspirational. Right? And I, I think that your work is so interesting and in that you always do like a little bit of both. And I, <laughs> and when I was looking at this, I really, I, I saw that in this book, I saw your, flavor combinations that are out of the box, the flavor combinations that I think are just such a reflection of British cookbook authors that have mm -hmm. so much more of a global sensibility than oh. American cookbook authors. Um, and I, but at the same time, you know, everything is, it's the one tin, it is easy or it's one yeah. bowl. I, what you've done here is not easy to do, is what I'm saying. <laughs> and it's your special brand of magic and it's, it's really something special. I think that you said something really interesting actually about the whole, like, it's really hard to change your style. And I think for me, one of the things that was trickiest was trying to put myself in the position of who I thought the reader of this book would be. Mm. Because I think, I can't remember if it's in this book or in the last book, but there was a line about why one tin. And the whole thing was that, you know, I have bakeware coming out of everywhere. It's under my bed. It's in my whole attic. My loft is completely bakeware or baking related. My kitchen has no space left. You're and in London. Space. I'm in a tiny little apartment in London. Yeah. yeah. Um, and because of that, I kept thinking, you know, not everyone has this giant magical cupboard that's full of every sort of bakeware. And so I kept trying to put myself in the mind of someone who would have just one tin or the tiniest space and one of the things I really love about this book is it went beyond the tin so you don't need a mixer for any of the recipes you could use a hand mixer to make some things easier but nothing requires a stand mixer um, and a lot of recipes just need a spatula or a wooden spoon and some bowls so it really limited that down um, but in regards to like, the aspirational, inspirational thing, I think you hit the nail on the head because every time I write a book, and it, is, it doesn't really matter what the book is on, I start with the idea that there has to be some things that are incredibly easy and some things that are more you know, aspirational. And the reason for that is I want my books to have longevity in your kitchen, on your shelves, 
And if you start by not being able to make anything or you've never been in the kitchen and you lack a little bit of confidence, the idea is that by the time you've worked through a few of, the, of those recipes, you'll start building up confidence. And there's still loads more for you to discover in the book. And so you'll live with it for years. So I think the reason I started doing more complex things is I like the challenge. So like I wrote, wrote a book on uh, French patisserie, um, simplifying it for a home baker. And it's still complex and it's still tricky, but I loved it because I really like that challenge. But I know not everyone is as nerdy as me when it comes to baking and just wants a cookie and they want it now. So that was kind of the whole idea of this one. <laughs> and I think that that's such a great thing to keep in mind too, is, is respecting your reader, knowing the needs of your reader, the average person who doesn't develop recipes for their job. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, you've got to keep it exciting for yourself because the journey of writing a book is a long, you know, a long one, even well, if it's not the world's longest book, right? Yeah. It's like yeah, you yeah. need something when you get to that stage. Uh, and I, I believe every cookbook author I've ever talked to, you get to that stage of your life, you know, you're either going to burn it all down, you know, jump off the roof or whatever you want to call it. And you're like, why did I say I would do this? Yeah. And I feel like... If you have really chosen a topic that you can personally connect with, that's going to be the thing that gets you over that hump, that gets you to the finish line. I think for me, that's probably why the flavors are always a little bit interesting or unusual or, you know, atypical. And it's because I always come from a place of flavor. And, you know, I've been asked to write cake decorating books before and I've just laughed because it's just... Not that's not book. baking. Can we say no, that? Cake decorating is not baking. It's skill and it's an art, but it's just nothing I'm interested in whatsoever. I can't do it. No, it's just I get really bored doing it. I have no patience for it. Um, but flavor is always what excites me and flavor combinations and finding something new. And I get these obsessions. And it's really funny when you said about um, trying to put your mindset into that of the reader my first thought was, well, I put myself into most readers, but not my boyfriend's, <laughs> because I always get these obsessions with flavors, and it always turns out it's something he doesn't like, so he couldn't ever live in the States, because he hates cinnamon in sweet goods, hates it, and so he says, oh, this has got cinnamon in it again, and there was, there was one recipe that has, like, a quarter of a teaspoon of cinnamon to make the oats taste more like oats. And he goes, it's too much. I'm like, it's a quarter teaspoon. And the same with cardamom. I have an obsession with cardamom. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, don't put cardamom in everything. But um, generally, like put myself in the wider public's uh, mindset, just not his. <laughs> That's so interesting. Cinnamon. Yeah, he's quirks. And does he like it in savory? Is that yeah. how? And he's yeah. fine with it. It's not like it's... But like I said, it's like not his, cinnamon's not his favorite thing generally, but he'll happily have it in something savory, but cardamom only in savory, doesn't like it in sweet. And even then doesn't like it loads, but yeah, peculiar man. Cardamom is, I, I can take it or leave it. No, it's my favorite. It goes with everything. It That's literally can go in every recipe. It's just, it's like, I, I think of it as like the magical baking spice in that I think you can put it into anything and make it taste better. <laughs> I am obsessed. I have like huge sacks of the stuff. I go through so much of it. I put it in my coffee. So I put and it- And do you grind it fresh? Do you uh, I grind it fresh. I sometimes buy a Swedish style, which comes pre-ground because the texture is quite good. Um, and I use it in when I make Scandinavian style things. Um, sometimes okay, I get- you really... get a Swedish cardamom? We have a Swedish um, supermarket in central London. And um, it's, yeah, we're very, very lucky in that, in that case. And so they sell a Swedish um, ground cardamom and it's incredibly fine. So if I want something where I want a lot of it, sometimes I'll use that so it doesn't have too much of a crunchy I want to see that link or what? It, what is it called? I want to find it. Can I order it? Uh, on it's called cardamom. No, that's the, the bun. I'll find it. It's in a little green packet. It's like in a McCormick spice jar. It's like a little jar and it's just got a green lid, but it's very, very fine. It's like any other ground spice and then it's really quite fine. Whereas when I grind um, cardamom fresh, it's always a little bit more chalky and strong. Yeah. Sure. All right, I'll have to give that a try. I mean, I've had it in some applications. I did a cookie for a spread that the editor really wanted cardamom and I think it was like mm -hmm. dark chocolate and coffee and cardamom, and yeah. oats. And yeah, no, and that was like, okay, I can get yeah. into this. And I've had like a cardamom bun at like a My Swedish favorite. bakery. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that's a singular experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think but, on its own, it's amazing. And mm -hmm. I think you can pair it with so many things. I think it works incredibly well with 
dark roasty flavor. So chocolate, coffee, like chocolate, coffee, and cardamom together is a winner for me. Right, I cheated. I just did like, I was like, well, I'll just go for the, the sure thing. It's so good together, but also things like, um, it goes great in coffee. Um, it goes great with any kind of caramelly flavors. It goes great with fruit. It goes great with everything. <laughs> I'll have to give it a try. So you said something that made me wonder when mm -hmm. I would like to hear about your creative process. So you didn't know going into this book that you would be doing it. It sounded like something that was presented to you, which is mm -hmm. such an interesting way to come at a book idea. So when you knew you were doing this, like what's your first step when you're developing an idea? For a book. So generally when I, so there's two ways and I think it will depend on the topic. So if it's an idea that I've come to myself, which is probably 50% of the books I've worked on, um, I, it will be a much slower process at the start, especially where I really kind of let the idea germinate in my head and start to think about what I would want to see in it. So as much as I'm writing for someone else, I'm also always writing for what I would want to buy. So if it's a cookbook, cause I'm, I buy a lot of cookbooks. So if I would buy it, then I think, okay, it would meet my standard. Um, so with this book, for example, because obviously um, there was, uh, it was a meeting where they said, would you be interested in writing a follow-up, making it easy. And so then sometimes I work better when there's actually a, a brief, like for a magazine, and for some reason, if I'm having a really bad, like, writer's block, but kind of for, for ideas, if I'm then working for a magazine and they go, we would want a piece on X, I suddenly become much more creative and I don't know why. Whereas if I'm trying to think of just random ideas, I find it harder to come up with new things. So I, I like kind of a wrapper for my creativity. So a book is great for me because I know it has to fit in a certain sphere and then I have much more freedom. Um, but for this one, I basically do, or for any book really, I do scatterbrain to start with. So I literally just write down any idea and it could be, sometimes I look back at the notes and they make no sense. Me too. And sometimes just flavor combinations, sometimes it's the name of a recipe, sometimes it's uh, like with the recipe from that I adapted from you, sometimes it's like, oh my God, this is a recipe that I love and I really like to present it in this way. And so this book, we wanted to do more vegan, more gluten-free things. And so I that. Wow. Yeah, okay. that, was, that was actually something my publisher asked for, um, which was tricky for me because uh, I'm n neither. Um, but that actually became an interesting thing in itself. Um, but for that one, I thought, what could I do that's gluten-free or vegan? And I thought that recipe is so, it has so many oats in it. I thought probably would work great gluten-free anyway. And so I started playing around with it and I thought, mm, I think this has got legs. So then I spoke to you. Um, but generally it is kind of scatterbrain onto a page to try and uh, come up with ideas. We settled on a chapter structure very early on. So normally with a proposal, I will think of an idea and then I think of a rough structure. Sometimes it does change, but rare, most of the times I get my chapter structure done almost instantly because I know what the book wants to look like. And then it's kind of filling in the pieces, which is the recipes. And I never write a complete list at the start, never. I've never once written a whole recipe list because I think it's limiting to ideas and to creativity. So normally within a month, I have maybe a third of ideas that I know will make it into the book. And then there's other ones that I like, I sometimes think this needs work as an idea, not even as a recipe. Um, and then sometimes recipes appear very near the end of the process and they kind of get slotted in. And the reason I actively don't um, write a full list is I find the recipes that I sometimes come up with whilst I'm not even thinking about it as I'm working on the project end up being my favorite. And I think because I think I, I start to see the book's structure and I go, it's missing this, it's missing that. And those recipes become useful. Um, flavor wise, I kind of have this now memory bank of things that I've tried, things that I like, uh, things that I, I know are popular. And I try and do those in an interesting way, or I try and pair them with something that's a little bit different. Um, and so there's a lot of that at the start. With, <laughs> with this book, it was different because um, I started writing it 
uh, when did I, I almost said something I'm not allowed to. Um, I started writing it last year and uh, partway through, I was gonna tell you a story that I'm not allowed to tell you because it involves something else. With another book that I worked on in the past, um, I basically started working on the book and then um, another work project came along, meaning I had no time. So I wasn't working on the book actively, but it was helpful because I needed time to germinate and think about it rather than go jumping straight in. So mm. sometimes I find during my kind of six months to a year of writing, the first month or so, I'm doing very little baking. And it's because I need to kind of mentally think how the book is gonna be and get it set in my head. So then when I start working on it, I can kind of go, I can start kind of slotting those recipes in better. But it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an odd process. And I'm not sure it's the best process, but it does seem to work. But at the moment it's, um, yeah, it's doing okay, I think. But sometimes no, I need to be more organized with it. <laughs> I think that uh, what you just said is is really uh, relatable to me. It sounds a lot like my own process. And I think something that was really a gift when I was writing Midwest Made because of the time that the publisher wanted it to come out, which was fall mm -hmm. 2019. And when the book was actually sold, I ended up with almost a year and a half to write that's that right. book. Yeah, that's amazing. It was just like, a wow. <laughs> you know, yeah, a dream. And I had never had that amount of time in writing no. a book before. Um, and, you know, certainly with your timeline in this book, you didn't have that, that kind of no, time. We, I think I had, for this one, I think I had seven months, mm -hmm. I think, to write it. Um, and then, but there was a, there's, so one of the unusual things about this book and the last one as well, is that I also shot food style. I did everything. Okay, and see, then, that's, a whole other not thing. A good idea. It's not a good idea. It's very stressful. I can't believe you're on this call right now, having gone through this. Um, but the reason it was useful is it meant I actually didn't do a traditional structure. So normally, it, for us here in the UK at least, you kind of live in your book cave on your own and you work on it almost entirely on your own until it's ready to hand in. Then you go through the edit process. Uh, and then depending on the timeline, the edit process happens at the same time as photographs or sometimes it's edit and then photographs. Um, but with this one, there was no photograph period because it was all shot by me as I went along. So it actually meant that uh, I was given a touch more breathing space than the publisher wanted um, in terms of delivery because I could deliver it when the photographs were meant to be delivered. So um, I do not like a short, book length I find it too stressful so the longest I've ever had is about a year and two or three months and I that was much much better um so this one I was like thank in some ways thankfully we were in lockdown because I had nothing else to do so it was fine well that's a really great point when you're in a, a position where life completely slows down yeah. and you can put everything into it I mean that's its own brand of crazy making to just be limited to yes. one sort of project. insane project. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've done it both ways. I've done books in six months and I, or one, one of them was in five months, six months. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, but the year and a half is, it's good and it's bad. You know, the more time that you get to sort of ruminate yeah. and like change your mind, you know, yeah. I always, that can be just as bad. Yeah, I, I think I would end up going back a lot and trying to make changes because everyone has that thing where the book comes out and they go, I wish I'd done this, I wish I'd done that. And with a year and a half, you have the time to really sit with it properly. Um, yeah. But I think for yours, I think one of the interesting things about it was obviously the book was so heavily research led and, you know, historical in a lot of ways that it made sense to me that you had the time because, you know, you had to go and find all of these, you know, historical books and whatever. Yeah. Um, and I have this kind of, it's probably pretentious and, writerly but I have this dream of like actually spending like two years writing a big chunky book on something I don't quite know what it is I, I have a couple of ideas but I would love the the financial freedom to do that but you know the the uh, financials of books are not what they were so it's not as easy to go I'm going to dedicate two years to a book because you wouldn't be earning enough money. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's uh, a very small number of authors who can who can do that. So few, yeah. Command that 
experience you know and yeah. i think that's maybe what people don't realize is like you have to be a certain level of you know i'm sure there's people out there that do that but you know yeah. <laughs> I'm not i think you have to be like someone that begins with n like nigella nigel Horston, <laughs> and a jamie you know i think those people have the guarantees of income from sales that they can do that whereas i have to hustle for every sale well see i I, you mentioned the queen first. So I, the queen meaning Nigella, not the actual queen of England, same thing. Um, so, but I- I know which one I prefer. <laughs> oh, snap, Ed. Um, I noticed you got yourself a cover quote from Nigella, a sort of book that becomes a true friend in the kitchen. I know from experience that Nigella does not give cover quotes to, to mm. very few people. It's like you and like, Diana Henry. So tell us a little bit about that experience and how you ended up with that quote. And was it as exciting for you as it is for a nerdy American like me to see yes. that on your cover? Yes. So I have actually never met Nigella. Um, oh. We've still not met. Um, we've emailed a couple of times and I have actually baked for her. Um, I don't know if this, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell the story because of someone else got me to bake for her. And they're both very well-known people. So I was very happy to do that, but I don't, it's never been told public because I'm not sure I'm supposed to tell it. So anyway, I baked for her once. And um, she is one of those people that is very supportive of people who aren't in her position. Mm -hmm. And I find that incredibly wonderful. She, especially in the last few years, she's become even better at it where she will, tweet and Instagram about books that she really likes from authors that don't have massive platforms and she this quote actually comes from the first book because she reviewed it on her website and she wrote this just amazing review of the last couple book and I was so thrilled about it and that line was the one that I just kind of gravitated to so I sent her an email and said hi could I very possibly please maybe use that quote on the new book and she said please do that would be wonderful so I was really really thrilled about that so um because I've asked people of her level before and had very nice no's but no's <laughs> and yeah. it is purely because you know there's not very many of them they don't get out very many and um, so I was very very happy so um yes that's a nice little badge of honor on the cover Absolutely. Um, and it's so interesting to hear you talk about sort of the levels in terms of personalities or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that we probably think about more than the average person is sort of like the hierarchy of stuff. But I think for a lot of people, you know, you're very much in that upper echelon as well. And maybe not, you know, singular first, you know, Nigella, Martha, whatever. I mean, who is <laughs> Ina, what do you, what is that even? It's like they, 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 they just float off to another planet. But um, it, I don't want to talk too much about the Great British Baking Show because I'm sure you've answered every question there is to, to, to answer. But, you know, we do, have, right. <laughs> we do have to talk about it because you are, you know, the Kelly Clarkson of the Great British ah. Baking Show. <laughs> Uh, I'm literally going to tweet that straight afterwards because I love that. Please do. I want Kelly Clarkson to follow me, so you know. I'm gonna. I'm gonna you definitely... should be so lucky, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, what it, what is that like to sort to to be the first of something? That's. Oh yeah. In, or is it? But I mean, it's going to be in your obituary, right? Like, what does that look like? That's going to be the first line. It's... <sighs> I have this discussion with a lot of people. Right. And there is a really interesting divide between the US and the UK. Okay, tell me about that. In the US, Bake Off is still genuinely loved, and especially those British seasons, um, especially earlier seasons. My season has actually never aired in the US. So I don't tell people that I just say, you know, when are a festival, you know, and then I just hope the research on TV show in the US doesn't check that. Um, but in the US, it still has a positive cachet in the industry in terms of publishers, magazines, newspapers, that sort of thing. In the UK, 
we have this thing where when something is successful, we get annoyed that it's been successful for too long. So we try and bring it down. And so it's a really negative part of our press, but it's just true. And I don't know why it is, but you see with more recent seasons, they don't get the same press. The, um, the books they've brought out haven't done very well in terms of sales, sadly. And there's just a slight reframing of opinion. And so in the US, it's the first sentence that we often use in press materials. Mm -hmm. In the UK, it's the last. And there is a reason for that. It's not because I'm embarrassed about it at all. It's because in the UK, you get slotted into a tiny little bubble and it's impossible to get out of it sometimes. And so I pitched a book uh, many years ago and um, I was told by multiple British publishers that they did not want a bake-off book. And this was after I'd had very successful cookbooks and a career in food writing. And it was maybe six years after I'd been on the show and it was impossible to get out of that box. Mm. So there is some negatives to the attachment in terms of trying to work. I completely love that's where I started and I will be forever thankful to the show and grateful and, you know, look back on that time as incredibly positive. But for some reason in the UK, if you started on a show like that, for any industry, it's really hard to get out of that box and for people to evaluate what you do beyond that, which is a little bit tricky. Whereas in the, U the US, I think there's more of a celebratory nature for people who have succeeded in anything sometimes. And so, you know, you tell someone in America that you want Bake Off and they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. And, th and that's in any part of, you know, from top to bottom of the industry to the public. And the public is still super, you know, uh, amazing in the UK, but industry are like, hmm, they're a bit over it. So um, I put it last to hide it. <laughs> well, I appreciate you being so candid about that because I, 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 hear what, I hear what you're saying. I think there is an American enthusiasm for anything that's like television related. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're the person who is the person who's done it, like it's after a while kind of makes you feel like you peaked in high school or something. You're just like, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm thrilled with like my career. I couldn't, there's very little I would change. I really like the kind of niche that I have carved out amongst kind of people who've been on that show. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of that. So I don't really have negative attachments to it. I slightly cringe when, say I do, I did an interview of the week and the first thing the um, journalist asked was, and it's because a lot of journalists don't have the time to do real interviews or research anymore. So they just see a bio and they see it and they kind of go, so what do you what do you think of Bake Off this year? I'm like, don't care, don't know, don't care. And yeah. it's, it's really fascinating to me about how Americans treat it uh, differently. And it's yeah. just interesting to watch really, but I definitely notice in the US, people will, I don't think they will ever get bored of, not necessarily watching the show, but of appreciating the kind of position you are in because of the show, like of any yeah. show. I think they definitely look up to that bit more, whereas we're a bit more jaded here, so. <laughs> well, to your credit and to, a few other people I can think of who've been on that show, whether or not that they've won. Mm -hmm. When someone has a very clear point of view and a very clear voice that's yeah. very unique, yeah. and they sort of use that as a, a platform for, okay, once your name is known, now more people are going to look at your stuff. Totally. But it's just the, you know, it's the pr preparation meets opportunity type thing. It's like- It's you completely that. that. It's 100% that, yeah. Yeah. I think I mean, sometimes- but I was to say, sometimes I think the reason it grates me a little bit is because some, especially journalists, will make it seem when they're talking to you that you, in, you owe your entire career to that first thing. Mm -hmm. And I always say, so the question I actually got asked the other day was, so, uh, something like, how much do you owe your career to Bake Off? And I thought, it's been 12 years. A, that's an odd first question. But I thought, do you really think that's all I've done? Like, I've had to work so hard and I 
it's not a negative. I'm not like complaining at all. It's, you know, the show got so many more viewers after I did it, millions and millions of more viewers. And so I did not have that kind of giant platform. Nobody cared at the start. And I was very happy about that because I wasn't being stopped in the street 20 times a day. Um, I was able to kind of figure out what I wanted to do with my life rather than being thrust into whatever. Um, and I love the fact that I've been able to have a career for, you know, 11, 12 years. And I don't believe it's now relying on that show. Whereas there are some people, it's not their fault at all. It's just the way the media works now is that they get on the show. They do a year of being, you know, in the, in the press all the time, doing lots of things, but then the media forgets and they haven't been able to find that time to figure out how they want to make that into a career. And it's yeah. really hard for them. And um, so I find myself really lucky that I was able to go on the show. It gave me a platform, but there wasn't the same kind of time pressure because the press didn't really care at the start um, mm. because the show didn't have the same viewing figure. So I feel very grateful and lucky for that. But talking about what you said about point of view, I completely agree in that there are people who've been on that show who haven't won, who are just incredibly talented. And I don't know it's public yet, so I can't say her, the, the person's name, but there is a cookbook coming out next year by someone who was on Bake Off who didn't win, who is my favorite contestant in terms of point of view, skill, um, recipe development, um, and it's coming out next year and it's gonna be amazing. So I, you know, when that can happen, I'm really thrilled. Um, and when someone's not just pushed into doing a, you know, me on the cover kind of thing, uh, and they get to do their own book in their own style. I love that. So I'm very excited. About this two person. sides of the coin. We could talk yeah. about that too. That's two different types of, you know, careers. Definitely. Totally. Like Completely. which one do you want? And it's so easy to get pulled, sucked yeah. into the, you should be the person on the cover of the cookbook mentality. It's really hard to say no to that in the start as well, because yeah. you just get told it will do better, you know, but it does yeah. pigeonhole you a little bit. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Hey, Laura. Now we're all going to have to guess who that book is from. When you probably already know. I have some. <laughs> I have You've probably seen some advanced material from it. Maybe a little. I haven't seen anything from it. I just know the author very well. And I know yeah. their work. Like, I don't know. I would have I would have to guess at this point okay. who you're talking about. But I'll message you later. Everything's delayed. <laughs> anyway, um, I have one quick question I wanted to step in mm -hmm. with. And then um, we'll wrap up. Uh, Jane would like to know... Uh, she says the recipes look fabulous. Is it possible to substitute non-vegan ingredients into the vegan recipes? Yes, it is. Same with the gluten-free recipes. So um, because I'm not gluten-free or vegan, when I was thinking about why I would be writing these recipes that are gluten-free and vegan, which is about a third of the book fall into that category, um, it was because lots of my friends are vegan or gluten-free. And so I kind of thought of it in that way, in that the book isn't necessarily for people who are 100% vegan or 100% gluten-free, but it's for our, you know, just the way we live these days. We know lots of people who eat that way or occasionally eat that way. And so the recipes that I worked on, I decided that I wanted to keep them incredibly easy to make for those styles of eating. So I didn't want to have to buy you know, endless amounts of different grains to make blends or having to buy unusual ingredients for the vegan recipes that are really hard to get hold of. So I set myself to only using um, one style of egg replacer and uh, one mix of flour. So in the US, I use a Bob's Red Mill mix. In the UK, I use a Dove's Farm mix. Um, and because of that, the way I worked is all those recipes are adapted from recipes of mine in the past and were reworked into a gluten-free or vegan base and then given a, a makeover in terms of flavor and style. But it does mean that all of them can be shifted back really easily. So if it uses two vegan eggs, it uses two eggs. If it uses gluten-free flour, you just use all purpose flour. It's a very easy substitution. And people have been asking that question a lot, which I wasn't expecting. Um, and people have been making the, some of the recipes that are either of those in a more traditional manner and they've all been completely fine. So yes, you can. I think there's a couple of, oh, if they use xanthan gum and an all, uh, um, a gluten-free flour, you just use all purpose. You obviously leave the xanthan gum out as well, but um, I tried to make it as 
accessible to everyone so you can shift them back we just never said in the book because i didn't expect people to ask <laughs> which i probably should have thought about yeah it's funny it's usually the other way around right usually yes. people want to know no one's asked the other way around free, they, <laughs> they rarely say well what if i'm not gluten free so yeah my publisher was so convinced there was going to be a big uh, vegan market for the book but i haven't had a single vegan person ask me can i make the non-vegan recipes vegan and I thought that would be the question we would get. So, um, and the answer to that is it's harder because <laughs> they weren't all tested that way and they weren't all worked that way. Whereas I know the ones that are vegan and gluten-free already can be taken backwards, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's, you know, people I think respect and appreciate the time that goes into that, right? So they maybe they, they're feeling like their needs were met with this book. There is definitely, I have to say, the skill level involved in developing gluten-free recipes, uh, sorry, not gluten-free, vegan especially recipes is hard. I have a friend who is writing a big vegan book at the moment, which will include a lot of baking. And it just, the amount, you have to know that world inside out to write recipes that are, that work for every style. It's, you know, tricky for sure. Yeah. And so respect your vegan writers. Yes. A different language vegan baking it's it a really is chemistry it's yeah, yeah. Whew. that Stop. was that was the trickiest part of the book for sure the yeah. vegan recipes took more testing than anything else yeah shauna did you have anything else i didn't i didn't mean to like jump in and interrupt you if you were on a roll there oh no oh i could talk to ed all day about all <laughs> kinds of things we could just gossip um i guess the the most natural way to sort of uh, wrap is to just um, you know, just tell us about your day to day now and, and what kinds of things you see yourself doing next. So my day to day at the moment is looking after my dog. Yes. <laughs> who um, I'm in your kitchen cabinets. Good yes, luck. Absolutely. He, um, he slows down my work process because he's still a puppy. So I'm working on a project at the moment um, for something down the line and it's been much harder. I had to take three months off work to look after him when we first got him because he was a tiny little puppy. Um, and I was very lucky that my partner's a lawyer. So I was able to take that time to kind of like try and train him. It didn't work. Um, so now my day is bounced between trying to recipe test and then trying to make sure the puppy stops barking at me whilst I'm in the kitchen because um, he does that a lot. And um, he assumes I'm making him food and when he doesn't get it, he barks at me. Um, mm -hmm. But at the moment, it, life is slowly getting back to normal here. So I'm doing a few more events. Um, I'm trying to do more teaching. I was hoping to be in the US for the launch. I don't think it's gonna happen because I don't think enough things are open yet to really justify it, sadly. Um, but I'm deep in a recipe testing project and I'm very tired <laughs> because of it. <laughs> I'm kind of in like go mode, um, so I'm kind of, trying to get as much stuff out to them as I can. But what I will say is the thing I'm working on is making me uh, accept it, so. Oh, that's great. Yes. It's so such a wonderful that. thing when you have that thing that's that that type of creative project that is energizing, that it, it exhausts you, but yeah. when you go to bed, you feel energized yeah, even yeah. when you're exhausted. It's funny because I think the reason is, is because of this book, I love this. I love both of these books. You should go buy them. They're all, they make great Christmas presents um, and Thanksgiving presents. Um, but and it's great because you can buy both together. I they have look great them. together. They should. They're great on a shelf together. They look so. I have an amazing <laughs> amount of books by both here. Look how cute! Yeah. It's a yeah, that's perfect so pairing. Dreamy. Exactly. Um, but there was a big limit on the book, and it's the tin. I love making this tin, but my brain ended with that tin. I cannot write any more nine by 13 recipes for a long time. And I, the thing I'm working on has no requirements tin wise. And my brain's like on fire for, oh, I can, I can make it in this thing. Oh, I can make it. And it's just really satisfying <laughs> because I'm like, I can just look at my bakeware and go, I want to make something in that, which is another way I get inspired. I will look at different bakeware and go, I haven't made anything in that in a while. And so I'm really excited that I get to bake in anything. <laughs> it's such a great example of when, like you said earlier in our conversation, that when you are given a brief, when you're given a wrap, when you're given yeah. limitations, sometimes you can be inspired within those limitations totally. and when those, that fence falls away, it's like, it's yeah. such a great well, The thing I'm working on has a fence, but it's completely different. So it doesn't limit 
it doesn't limit my creativity in really any sense beyond one very small thing cool. which i'll tell you about later <laughs> I can't wait. Well, thank you so much for having me oh, yeah. talk with you. Such an honor. Like I, th these books are beautiful. This new one is, I can't wait to start baking from it. And Thanks, I'm Anna. to have my name in it, even just a little <laughs> bit. Ah, so great. So yeah. thank my you pleasure. so much, Shauna, for leading such a wonderful conversation. Thank That's you, great. Ed, for joining us all the way from the UK. Congratulations on the book. I hope that you will both come visit us in person for your next ones. I hope so. I want to. I want to come and do press. Yeah, yeah. Please do. You're really Anything restricted. Here, right? if you decide you want to come visit. This is the little yeah. house in my backyard. You're welcome to see it. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah. And you too, Shauna. <laughs> yes, I would love to come to Seattle. Um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Like I said, we will post this uh, to YouTube in the next couple of days. Everyone, have a lovely rest of your weekend, and I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank very you. much. Guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye.